Wow. Good morning. Wow. Thank you, man. That was that was great. Can we give him another hand. My, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just choking back. I tell you what, it, it is good to see young people serving. And I think, and I want you to know how important that is, because they need to understand this is not mom and dad's church. This is our church. And so when you allow them to serve like that, that's, that's really what that means. And so I, I appreciate that. Uh, so for Danae and for Jackie and Denise and Kayla and all you guys have worked so hard, thank you so much for, for that. Amen. Amen. So we're, we're glad to see you here this morning. I, I, we didn't know how, who was going to show up, but we are so glad that you have come out to be with us as far as our worship. And if you're watching online, we want to thank you for being a part of our ministry here today. Would you bow in prayer with me as we seek the Lord? Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. I pray right now as we open up your word that you speak to our heart, as you would take, Lord God, a hold of every part of our minds, remove every distraction that we may hear your word. Father, I pray that your spirit would move in spite of me, that you would take your holy word by the person of the Holy Spirit and you'd use it in our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So again, we're glad that you're here. Uh, next week, we're having a uh, baptism. And so uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Josh announced that baptism. Now, it's going to be a little different. The baptism is going to be at the end of the service. And so we're actually going to close the service on the stream. The people on the stream will not be able to see the baptism. Only those who are in the house will be able to see the baptism. But we're going to do that a little bit different uh, next week. So he is risen. He is risen indeed. Man, this is, this is a great time. And so I, I entitled this, The Greatest Weekend Ever. And you got to say it like a valley girl. The Greatest Weekend Ever, right? That's how you got to say it, right? So, uh, so, so uh, and so as you think about, oftentimes when we think, we think of great, we think of um, fun, exciting, uh, just uh, relaxing. I mean, that's what we great. But actually, the idea of great means it is remarkable in its magnitude, in its degree, in its effectiveness. It means to be superior in character, superior in, in quality. And so the idea means it's full of emotions. So when you think about this weekend, this weekend was full of emotions. They went from the, the valley of the Grand Canyon to Mount Everest. In terms of that, and if people say, ah, that was that was a wild weekend, but it was great because of this effectiveness. There is no other event in the history of man that had the impact of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's none. And so as we celebrate this, I really want to look at this. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to, to Luke. Luke chapter, uh, turn to chapter 22. And we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about this weekend, and we divide this weekend actually in three days. It was, it was Friday, it was Saturday, and it was Sunday. And so actually what happens is on Thursday, and we're, we're going to run through this really quick, uh, and you'll take time to read it on your own, hopefully, if you haven't never read it before. But we're going to look at Luke's Luke's report of what happened this great weekend. And so what, what happens in, in Luke 22, what we're told is, is that Thursday night, Jesus had a dinner. And he had his friends with him. He didn't call us. I don't call you servants. I call you friends. And I have you with me. And he had this, this great dinner. It was the Passover meal. And they gathered together. And during this meal, they talked and they celebrated and they laughed. And then at some point, Jesus um, took a towel and began to wash their feet, and he instituted the Lord's table. He gave them bread in the cup and basically said, I want you to continue to do this after me. And they had this great dinner. And so far, the weekend's looking pretty good. That was Thursday. Now, again, that was Thursday, probably between 6 o'clock in the evening and 9 o'clock at night. They had this great dinner, this great meal. At 9 o'clock... They went out to a garden and Jesus began to pray in this garden. 
In fact, he took, he took his disciples with him, and, and, and what happens in, 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 in that point, what, what happens then, is he goes to his garden, and he begins to pray, and Luke tells us that he prayed so hard, it was like great drops of blood coming from his head. Now, the other, the other uh, gospels tell us this, that he prayed and came back, and he came, pray, came back, and he did it three times, and when he came back, they were sleeping, and he sort of got on them. Couldn't you guys stay awake, Right? Now, think about this. You just had this great meal, this big meal at six o'clock to nine o'clock. What are you doing at 10 o'clock? Right. Sometimes we get on. We're sleeping, aren't we? Right. But he expected them to stay awake. And so as he prays and he comes back to them, he says to them, listen, couldn't you guys stay awake? And then what happens is this. This is now that's between nine and 10 o'clock at night. Now, most of us know what happens when we start praying at nine or 10 o'clock at night. Right. It's not long before we fall asleep. Sometime about 12 in the morning, which would be Friday morning, 12 in the morning, there's a group of people who come and arrest him. And he probably have torches and a group of a, a, a army of people come and they arrest Jesus. And during that time, what Luke tells us, as you read through the book, look, Luke, Luke says this, that, that one of Jesus' servants takes out a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the people who are coming to arrest Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus took the ear and put it back on. And then they have this dialogue about why they're coming to arrest him. And, 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 and Jesus says this, John tells us this, that Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus. And Jesus says, I am he. And the Bible says in John, he says, and they fell down. And then they got back up. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they said, we, we're trying to find Mr. Jesus. Is he here? Right? Jesus was, the, the idea of that was this. Jesus would let them know they were not taking his life. He was surrendering his life. So now this happens about 12 to 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, please understand, all this time, Jesus has been awake. Sometime at 3 o'clock in the morning, it says there, what happened was they, 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 they had this, 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 uh, this court that they put together. They, had, they, they, they put together this, 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 this court. Now, it's very interesting. When, when, when Jesus, when, when they came to arrest him, the Bible, Luke tells us this, that one of his disciples is the one who betrayed him, and he actually comes and betrays him with a kiss because they don't know who Jesus is. They have no idea. And so he says, how are you going to know who Jesus is? He's going to be the one that I kiss. And so he comes up to him and he kisses him, a kiss of betrayal. Now, it's very interesting that that night at dinner, Jesus predicted and even said that one of you was going to betray me. And so after they arrest him, his disciples disperse. And then you have this idea where Peter forsakes him. Peter's asked three times, you, you, you've got to be one of them. He said, no, no, I'm not one of them. I, I don't even know the man. But at dinner, Jesus had told Peter, Peter, you're going to forsake me three times before the cock crows. It's interesting as you look at this, that everything in this great weekend, everything that happened in this great weekend, Jesus had already predicted what was happening and told them exactly what was going to happen. Why does, that, why does that mean? Because it wasn't circumstances. God had planned this, appointed this. It was to happen. And he knew exactly what was to happen. So it says, it, 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 it says there that, that after, after Jesus forsook him, it, say, it says there that they mocked Jesus. And, and they beat him. Those who came to arrest him, as they're taking him to this court, they beat him and they arrest him and they beat him. And they mock him, they tease him, they talk about him. And then he goes to council. He, he goes before the council. And this is what happens. Jesus has four trials in a matter of five hours. Now remember what time of day it is. It is, it is like three, four o'clock in the morning. And they take him to the high priest and he is judged by the high priest, and they claim he is guilty. So at some time between 4 and 6 o'clock in the morning, he's, he's been tried by the high priest. And then they take him to Pilate. 
Now, Pilate is the, the king of the, of the region over Judea, and they bring him before Pilate, and Pilate says, he examines him, he says, I cannot find where this man has done anything guilty. And they rise up and say, no, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. And so Pilate, what Pilate does, Pilate said, I'm sorry, uh, Pilate, did I get that right? He, they take him to Pilate, Pilate sends him to Herod, because he finds out he's Galilean. And Herod is the king over the Galileans, and Herod just happens to be in Jerusalem. So he sends him to Herod, and Herod examines him. And after Herod examines him, Herod says, I, I don't think anything wrong with him either. He's not done anything wrong. So what I'll do, what, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send him back to Pilate. And so he comes to Pilate again, and Pilate says, I don't know what to do with him. I'll tell you what, I will, I will beat him and then release him. They say, no, 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 crucify him. And the Bible says that what happens is there was, there was a history that they would release a prisoner. And so there was a man by the name of Barabbas, and he said, you know, listen, do, do we let Barabbas go or do you want Jesus? Who do you want? And they said, we want Barabbas, a murderer. And so Herod... Pilate basically says this, my hands are clean of this, but I'm going to do this because this is what you want. And he sentenced Christ to be crucified. Now, Mark 15 tells us this, before he turned them over to the Romans to be crucified, it says there that they scourged him. They flogged him. They, 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 they laid him out and they beat him. Oftentimes what would happen, it would, take a, 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 it would be a rope with glass and rocks that was, in, that, were, that was tied into the rope, and they would beat him 39 times. And then they made him carry his cross. And by this time, he was too weak to bear his cross because he had been beaten so much that they found somebody else to carry his cross. And they carried his cross out to a place called Golgotha, the, the skull. And when they got out there, they crucified him. Now, it, 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 I'm, I'm not going get, to get, 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 get too into this, but we understand the idea that Christ was crucified. But Isaiah says this. Isaiah said that his figure was so marred that you could not even tell who he was. He says he had been so beat up, you could not even tell it was a human who had been beaten up. And then they hung him on a cross and they crucified him. And Luke tells us they crucified him between three, two thieves. And they had this dialogue while they were on the cross and they were going back and forth. And one said, hey, save yourself and save us too. And the other thief says, don't you have any respect? This man has done nothing wrong. How's this weekend going for you so far? Not too cool, is it? And he dies on the cross. He finally, he finally says, Father, into your hands I commit my soul, my spirit, and he, and he dies on the cross. What happens then, actually about 9 o'clock, I, I went too fast, about 9 o'clock in the morning, after he's gone through his court cases, they put him on the cross. At 12 o'clock in the afternoon, the Bible says that the whole, the whole sky became dark. And from 12 to 3 o'clock, the sky was dark, and at 3 o'clock, he gave up the ghost. He died. They took him off the cross, and there was a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea who had a plot. He went to Pilate and said, can I have his body? And they buried him in a cave. Now, all this happened on Friday. We're talking about the greatest weekend ever. All this happened on Friday. Because Saturday was the Sabbath, they could not do any work on Saturday, so it was probably at 5 o'clock at p.m. that Jesus was placed into a cave. Now, can you imagine being one of his followers? One of his followers, you've been following this man all this time for three years. He's going to take over things. He's going to make things right. And all of a sudden, all your dreams have died because the person you were putting your trust in has now been killed. And you're really lost. In fact, the Bible says this, that some of them had not, didn't know what to do. They went into hiding, and then some of them went back to doing what they were doing before. That's what happened on Friday of the greatest weekend ever. Now, Saturday, he's in the grave. Saturday, he, he is, he, he's in the grave. And, and, and the amazing thing about Saturday 
and I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it, read a couple of scriptures here. Is Peter and Colossians gives us indication of what happened on Saturday. Because remember, his body has died. But we understand this is not who we are, right? He has a divine spirit. Let me, let me just read what happened on what, what Peter says in Peter chapter, um, Peter chapter 3. And then I'll look at, I'll look at Colossians. Peter chapter 3. You know what? I tell you what, let's back up. I skipped I skip something. I skipped something. Let, 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 let me look at a couple of verses. Matthew, these are come up on the screen. Matthew 20, 28. It says, even as Jesus, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The word ransom is a payment that is paid in order to, sleep, to, to, to release a slave from slavery. It is something that you pay to release somebody from slavery. He says, Jesus Christ gave him his life as a ransom for many. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages, the penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God's put a penalty on death. The penalty, penalty of sin is death. And so somebody had to pay the price. We're talking about why what happened on Friday happened. Because Jesus had to pay the price for our sins. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That, that, that just blows me away. That for the joy that was set before him, there was something that happened on Friday that gave him joy. Even though it was the valley, the lowest of the lows. And you know what that was? I'll tell you what that was that gave him joy. As he went to the cross on Friday, he looked down the road of the future and saw you and I. And realized that what he was doing was going to save us and make us children of God. And because of that, there was joy in going to the cross. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Read this one with me. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that, he might die, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. That's the purpose of Friday. The purpose of Friday was that Jesus Christ died for our sins of the greatest weekend ever. Saturday, he was in the grave. Saturday, they, 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 put, him, they put him in the grave on Saturday. Let me just tell you what Peter says. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this. Let no one disqualify you. I'm sorry, I'm in, I'm in uh, Colossians. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to us, bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited on the day of Noah. Now, what does that mean? On Saturday, while they were celebrating the Sabbath, the Bible says that Jesus' spirit went to the abyss. What is the abyss? The abyss is the holding place for those evil spirits who sinned against God waiting for judgment. That he went down to the abyss and he proclaimed victory to the demons who were in the abyss. And in fact, C C Colossians says this, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2 says this. He, sa he, says, he says, by concealing the record of debt that stood against us, legal demands, thus he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed rulers and authorities, putting them to open shame and triumphing over them. The word triumph, the word triumph as, as the idea of what would happen was when a, when a general would win a war, 
they would have a parade. And he would march through the cities and it was called a triumph parade. And he would march through the cities proclaiming victory. And what he would do, he would carry his prisoners behind him. And the crowd would cheer because he won victory. What happened on Saturday was this. Jesus went down to the abyss of hell and he held a parade. Now you a bad boy when you do that, ain't you? <laughs> he held a parade in hell. Claiming victory, claiming that he had won victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the grave, victory over the world, victory over Satan, that Satan was defeated and he disarmed. The word disarm means he, he made useless. He took away the power of Satan. Greatest weekend ever. But it's not over yet. We got one more day. On Sunday, Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, but on the first day of the week, early at early dawn, they went to the tomb to take spices that they had prepared for him. The ladies go to the tomb. They, because, because they rushed him off the, off, off, the, off, the, uh, off the cross and had to bury him quickly before the Sabbath, he didn't get the proper dressing as, 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 a person, as a body would be dressed. So they come early morning because they need to take these spices down and they need to dress the body. So right when sun came up on Sunday morning, and they found the stone that was rolled away from the tomb. But when they had went, they did not find the body of Jesus. And while they were perplexed about that, this, behold, two men stood there dazing in, daz in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and they bowed their faces to the ground, the men say, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has, he has, he has risen. That's what we celebrate today, right? That he is risen. He is risen. And, and, then, he, and then he says, like, like he told you. He is not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you. While he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remember these words. It was interesting that all through Christ's time with them, Christ kept telling them, exactly what was going to happen. Luke chapter 18, this is what's going to happen. They're going to be turned over to the Gentiles and the Gentiles are going to crucify me and they're going to bury me and I'm going to rise again. But somehow it didn't click with them. But now he, they come to see the body and he's not there. And it begins to click with them that he's risen. Let me just give you a couple of verses. I'm going to go these verses pretty quick. Acts chapter 2 verse 24. God raised him up and loosed the pains of death. He destroyed and put off the pains of sorrow of death because, get this, it was impossible for, it was impossible for him to be held by it. Praise team just sang a song about that, right? That death no power on earth, no power under the earth, no power in heaven could hold Jesus in the grave. It was impossible for that to happen. Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the first person to die and never rise again, the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood we were freed by his blood Romans chapter 14 says this Christ died and rose again for this very purpose to be the Lord of both the living and the dead of both the living and the dead L let me give you real quickly five things for those who are believers that the resurrection means five things that the re resurrection means for us the first one is this the first one is this. The resurrection, it assures us of our future resurrection. It assures us of our future resurrection. 
1 Corinthians 6, 14. For God raised the Lord and he will also raise us up by his power. The resurrection of Jesus Christ assures us that when you and I die, we're going to be raised up. We're going to be raised up. We're not going to be left in the grave. Because God raised him up, we're going to be raised. Number two, it is the heart of our witness. It is the heart of our witness. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace fell upon them. The resurrection is the heart of our... In fact, I want you to understand this. The gospel is incomplete without the resurrection. After Jesus rose from the dead, Luke tells us this, that he told that the, the, the angels told the women to go tell the disciples they didn't believe him. But then he met two guys on their way to uh, 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 Emmaus. And he declared himself to them. And they went and told the other disciples, guess what? He's risen. He's risen. And then he appeared to all the disciples at one time. If there is no resurrection, the resurrection is the highlight. It is the heart of our witness. The songwriter said this. The songwriter didn't say this. Alan Jackson didn't say this. I serve a savior who lived in the world. He said what? I serve a living savior who's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what man may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of care. And just the time I need him, he's always there. He what? He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. Because he lives in my heart. See, I want you to understand this. What good is a dead savior? A dead savior cannot do anything for us. It has, he has no power to do anything for us. So it wasn't enough for Jesus to die on the cross. Jesus had to get up from the grave. And so the meat of our testimony is the resurrection. The meat of our testimony is a resurrection. Number three, we share in his victory. We share in his victory. Jesus went down to the abyss and he claimed victory. He preached victory. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the grave, victory over Satan, victory over the world. He preached victory. And what the resurrection does, it understand that we share in his victory. Let me read some verses for you. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Your faith. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Romans 8, 30, 37. No, in all these things, we are conquerors. In fact, he didn't say conquerors. He says, we are more than conquerors. That same word is there, that idea of victory. We are more than conquerors. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ allows us in triumphal procession. I talked about what that procession was, right? That victory parade that they have. He says, He allows us to be a part of that victory parade. So what does the resurrection mean to us? Because of Christ resurrected from the grave, not we say it, but Jesus says, you're victorious. You're an overcomer. You're a triumphant. See, I, I, here's my guess. So often, as believers, we live a defeated life. And Satan has defeated us. We're down. We're discouraged. We can't put our heads up. But because of the resurrection, Jesus himself claims to us, that you are victorious, that you are an overcomer, that you are triumphant, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I think what needs to happen is as believers, when we think of the resurrection, we need to live in light of what God says about us. Not in light of how we feel, what God says about us. Because of the resurrection, we have power. Because of the resurrection, we have power. Ephesians Chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. 
Ephesians chapter 1. Paul is praying in Ephesians chapter 1. And he says this in verse 18. He's praying for us. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know, that you may understand the hope to which he has called you. With what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And the third thing he says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of, of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and has seated him at the right hand of heavenly places far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion above every name that is named. What does the resurrection mean, folks? I, I want you to get this. The resurrection means that there is power available to us as believers. In fact, not just any power. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave, God has made available to his children to live by. That same power he has given to us to live this Christian life out to be a witness in, in this world. That same power that raised him from the grave is now sitting him on, at the right hand of God. He is over every principality, every authority. He is over everything. Every, every other power, every other authority bows to Christ. And he's made that power available. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Let me ask you, better, better do you believe it. Do you live that way? Because oftentimes what we believe here never catches on here, does it? Right? And I'm guilty of that myself. That same power that he's given us. The fifth thing I want to say is this. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says this. The fifth thing is this, that we should live for him. That we should live for him. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge this, that if one died for all, that if one loved us enough to die for all, then all are dead. And he who died for all, that those who live, those who have accepted Jesus Christ, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The fifth thing the resurrection should do is this. It should help us to realize that now, I have to surrender my life to him and live for him. I'm no longer living for myself. When I think about the fact that Jesus Christ became a man and died on the cross for me, he loved me that much to die for me. It should make me want to say, Lord, here's my life. I'm now going to live for you. I'm going to stop living for myself and I'm going to live for what, you're, what you desire. I'm going to fulfill your, 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 your will and your, 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 your privilege in my life. Your purpose is in my life. We now live for him because of that. So that's, that, that's what should happen to those who were saved. The greatest weekend ever because of the impact. There has never been a greater weekend ever. There were lows, but there were highs. And it has had a greatest impact that's ever been by any other weekend. So I want you to understand this, and this is what we need to get at. If you're not saved, or if you're not sure that you're saved, this is what you need to understand about the resurrection. If there was any way possible that you and I could get to heaven on our own, then God was foolish in sending Jesus to die. Right? If I could be good enough to get to heaven on my own and we could work at getting to heaven on our own, then there would be no reason for Jesus to die on the cross. 
Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because there was absolutely no way that you and I could get to heaven on our own. We can't do it. We can't do it. Ephesians says this, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. You and I cannot be good enough, act good enough, try hard enough to get to heaven. It's not going to happen. And we have this idea that someday I'm going to get to heaven and God is going to weigh my good against my bad. And somehow, just maybe, hopefully, my good is going to outweigh my bad. We have no good. We can't get to heaven on our own. It is only by grace. It is only by God. In fact, Jesus says this in Matthew. In Matthew 7, he says this. In the last day, there are going to be people who are going to come to me. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord. Didn't we do this and this and this? And they're going to have this long list of all the things they did. I served in the choir. I ushered. I gave food. I gave money. I helped people. They have this long list of all these good things. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, and I will say to them, depart from me because I never knew you. Now, here's the scary thing about that. The people who are coming to him to say the things that they did, all these things they did, all the things that they mentioned they did were things that church folk do. He's talking about people who are sitting in the church Sunday after Sunday who are hoping that their works are going to get them to heaven. And he says, I will say to them, Depart from me. I never knew you. You never had a relationship with me. You never asked me to forgive you of your sins. You've never accepted me. Please understand, it is by faith. It is not by works. It is by faith and faith alone that we're going to stand before God and we're going to be able to get into heaven. So why, so why, why would God do all of this? Why would God do all of this? Here's the greatest thing about this weekend. It's not only the greatest weekend in the history of man, but it's more than just an event. It's about a person. It's about a relationship. It's not just an event. He did this so you and I could have a relationship with a person can have a personal, eternal, intimate relationship with the God of God and the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. It's about a person. So why would God do this? This is why God would do this. God did this. John 3.16 tells us why he did it. For God so loved the world. He did it because he loves us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus went to the cross. This great weekend happened. Because for some reason, God loves Irv Clark. For some reason, God loved you in spite of you. God loved me in spite of me. He loved me in spite of the fact that I kept messing up. I couldn't save myself. I couldn't do right. He loved me anyhow. Romans chapter, chapter 5 says this, but God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did it because he loves us. He loves us. Romans chapter, eight, chapter 10, verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9 says this. If you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you shall be saved. Folks, listen. I, this, 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 is, this is the meat of this. I don't know where you are with Christ. I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus Christ. But I want you to know that God loves you so much that Jesus died for you. 
He went and buried into a grave. He was in a grave on Saturday. On Sunday morning, he got up from the grave and he did all of this because he loves you, because he wants to give you an opportunity to be saved. Timothy says this, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth, that all might be saved. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you've ever been to a place where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But I want to give you that opportunity today. I want to give you that opportunity today. And sometimes we take this for granted. Okay, well, Lord, I got time. It's not a big thing. I, I, no, we don't know how much time we have. We don't know how much time we have. The Bible says this, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after death comes the judgment. We have every head bow. Maybe God is speaking to you today. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Clark, I, I think I go to heaven. I'm not sure I go to heaven. And maybe you're here today and say, you know what? I know I would not go to heaven. I want you to know that Jesus died for you. And there's nothing you can do to get to heaven but accept by faith, believe by faith what he's done for you and accept. And I want to lead you in a, in a, in a prayer. And you're not praying to me. You're not praying to anybody else around you. I want you to put everybody else out of your mind right now. It's just you and God. And I want you in your own heart to voice this prayer to God. Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. And I want to ask you to forgive me of my sin. I believe with all my heart that Jesus died and rose again to pay for my sins. And I want to ask Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, listen, I don't know where you are. I don't know uh, um, how God is working your life, but I'll tell you this. This is what I want you to do. On the back of your chairs, in some of those chairs, there's a, there's, there's a card here. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe it's been the second time, you prayed that prayer and you met business with God, God says this. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God says, if, if a man or a woman or child prays to come to me, I will save them. I ask you to take this card and fill this card out because we, we want to get a hold of you. We want to get in touch with you. We want to have a chance to talk with you about, about, about this relationship with Christ. Or maybe you're saying, you know what, I'm not sure about this. I, just, I still have some questions. We'd love to be able to answer your questions. We'd love to be able to answer your questions. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that we celebrate the greatest weekend ever because of the greatest event ever. And you made it possible for us to have a relationship with the greatest person ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.